Hi, I'm Stacy Alexander. I'm the worship leader at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church in Bowman, Georgia. We're so excited that you decided to join us today, whether you're watching live or on demand. We hope that you receive a blessing from today's sermon. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name's Sarah. I've been coming to Pleasant Grove since last August. You may have seen me serving with the youth ministry or helping out with Centerfield Coffee Shop as that, that's been getting started up. I just wanted to welcome you and let you know that we are so glad that you're here and that this service leaves you renewed and encouraged and challenged. If it's your first time here this Sunday, we especially want to welcome you. There's a gift waiting for you in the Welcome Center over to the left over here. So please go pick that up. Go ahead and greet somebody, give them a hug, and hope you have a great Sunday morning.
Jesus this morning. Give him a hand clap of praise if you're grateful for Jesus. All right. Now, come on. Yeah, y'all be seated just for a moment. I tell you what, uh, while those, these girls are coming up, uh, I just want you to look around at some of uh, our uh, new faces on our platform today. Stacy and her family are vacationing together this weekend, and so we're grateful that David and Jennifer are here and uh, David leading our worship for us. And then we have a, a little bit of color back on the drums back there. Uh, <laughs> So we're glad Jason's back there. I appreciate so much Miss Martha coming in and handling the keys for us. And uh, we uh, just miss her. She's searching for a, a new church family out in Athens where she's moved to. And so we're just so glad that she's here this morning. Just grateful for everybody who serves so faithfully on this platform. And uh, so just so glad that all of you are here to, to be with us today and enjoy that. So these girls behind me, do I have to stand behind y'all or y'all? Are... Okay, I'm good. All right. So these are the girls of American Heritage Girls Troop 1226. They've been busy stirring up special, utens a special meal for you. This meal includes pork loin, chicken, green beans, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, rolls, sweet tea, water, and a variety of desserts. Mm, hallelujah in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you for the desserts. Thank you, Lord. The girls would like to... If y'all got chocolate? Y'all got chocolate something down there? Brand, yeah. Thank you. Jesus loves me. Thank you. All right. So the girls would like to send a special thank you to Lee Griffey and Robert Massey for cooking our, all of the meat today. And they'd like to invite you all to come join us right after the service uh, it, today in the gym for lunch. Uh, they look forward to serving you. And this is a donation only uh, project. So dig deep, boys and girls, and enjoy this lunch. So would y'all give them a big hand clap of praise? I love these kids. They are doing some great stuff. And so uh, if you uh, have a young lady, get them involved in this ministry. I'm telling you, they are doing some great stuff. Well, there are a couple of other folks that we want to recognize during this time right now. Um, and these are some TSA students who uh, are in our ministry who competed at the state level yesterday. And so I'm just going to kind of tell you what they did and, how, and if they're progressing to the next level. And so uh, Cassidy Gaines, are you in here? Somewhere, okay, come up here. I want you to come on the platform. Cassidy play, placed fourth in state in prepared presentation, fourth in off the grid, and tenth in leadership strategies. And Peyton Gaines, are you in here? Peyton, is she here? Uh, she placed fourth in promotional design, fourth in off the grid, and tenth in leadership uh, strategy. Um, Nick Carlson, are you in here? Nick, come on, Nick, come on, baby. Nick placed fourth. Nick placed fourth in career prep, and the middle school finished sixth overall uh, chapter. They will be going on to compete at nationals in Atlanta. So Nick is part of that. And then Savannah Gaines, come on up to the platform. And Savannah's from our high school, uh, Hart County High School, and she placed fifth in digital video production and fourth in SciViz. Is that how you say that, SciViz? And so uh, we got some smart cookies in our midst, I'm telling you. And so we just want to give them big hand clap of praise. So. Okay, y'all good. So we just wanted to love on them just a little bit. Okay, I have one more thing, and I want to just bring your attention to those green bins that have been in the worship center for the last couple of weeks. So they are full, well, not completely full, but halfway full, at least that one's halfway full of empty Easter eggs. Now I'm just going to tell you, it's a sad day when a child has to get an empty Easter egg. <laughs> 
I remember my dad, when I was a child, taking me to the Stone Mountain uh, Easter egg hunt, and they boiled Easter eggs then, and there were thousands of people, and I remember being drugged through the woods with briars and getting half of a broken egg. And so it's my, child, it's my adult dream to make sure no child ever gets drugged through the briars and gets an empty Easter egg, all right? So I, I'm asking you for accountability here to help me. Uh, fill those Easter eggs. Uh, take them, fill them up. Go buy new ones, fill them up. Bring them all back this week, especially by Sunday, because our Easter extravaganza is next Sunday evening. So we want to invite all of you. This is a church-wide event for our children and our adults to enjoy. We'll have some great three big inflatables. We're going to be enjoying dinner, dinner together. Uh, we're roasting hot dogs. So we're providing, the church is providing the hot dogs and the buns. We want you to bring the fixings. Ketchup, mustard, onions, chili, baked beans, slaw, chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. So, um, and drinks if you want something other than tea. So looking forward to that. We will have everybody here on campus by 530. We will hunt properly at 545. So we don't lose the time. We will hunt rain or shine. We thankfully have great buildings. So we'll be here and hope to see all of you here next Sunday evening. So we're glad you're here. Oh, you go ahead, honey. I just wouldn't want to, you just go ahead. There you go. Glad you're here today. Hey, I want to ask, wow, I want to ask our ushers to come forward. We're going to receive our morning offering. If you're visiting this morning for the first time, let me tell you what this is all about. A lot of people say, I came, and man, they talked about offering. And I haven't been to church in 20 years, and they still talk about offering. We talk about it every week, and here's why. Because when we tithe, it literally proves to, I, th I think God already knows our heart. But it proves that we know God owns everything. And so ten, a tenth, what Scripture teaches, is how we prove that to ourselves and to those around us that, hey, we believe that God is in charge of it all. We give a tenth back to do that. I challenge you, if you're a believer in Christ, to be obedient to the Word of God, you should tie the tenth of your income. Don't make any apologies for that because that's what the Word of God says. So if you want to be obedient, walking in obedience, you want God to supply your needs according to His riches and glory, what the Scripture says, uh, our part in that is the 10% back. So I trust that you be obedient as a believer in Christ. Let's pray together. Scoot, pray for us, would you?
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we sure love you today and thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, I pray right now that you would settle our hearts and our minds and our attention on what you want to share with us this morning through the Word of God. Lord, I pray right now that the Word, Lord, would not just be something from my mouth, but it would be God-breathed from the Word of God. And I pray that today, Lord, that if there's anyone sitting here today that's never trusted you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray right now in the sound of my voice, I pray in Jesus' name for the Holy Spirit to begin to deal. If he's not already, begin right now to open up the heart to the truth and the Word of God. And then, Lord, I pray at the end of this message for freedom to do what you say, freedom to respond, freedom to take you without apology and unashamedly, Lord. Move in this place right now. We're going to thank you in advance, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you be seated? Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 14. Began last week starting a brand new series called Cross Point, leading us up to Easter. And I was in the book of Luke, but as I began to kind of look through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I don't want to take this for granted, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called the Gospels in the New Testament. Those are written by four different men. In fact, the author of the book of Mark is really not even 100% sure as far as who exactly it was. But in these four Gospels right here, these four Gospels tell pretty much the same story. Although, uh, when it comes to the birth of Christ, Luke is a little bit more detailed because Luke was a doctor. And he tells a lot more about the physical part of it. But in this passage, when we're talking about uh, where Peter denies Christ... Mark gives us just a kind of an extra nugget. I really don't want you to miss this because there are some incredible truths uh, in Mark chapter 14 about where Peter denies Christ. Now, I'm going to ask you not to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you this question just for you to ponder it. How many times have you denied Christ? How many times have you denied Christ with your actions, with your words, uh, with your friends, with your uh, whatever's going on? How many times have we denied Christ? How many times have we been in the spot where Simon Peter was at? Now, we might not have got called out. It might not have been where, you know, the Lord Jesus was in earshot as far as physically, but he was in, I mean, you know, he's there all the time anyway. And so we have denied him so many times. We've got to be careful taking a shot at Peter because we've been there. In fact, many times we're there. We kind of live there at times. We come, I, I give you for example. We come up on a group of guys. Let's just say, let's just talk about the men just a minute. You come up on a group of guys, and they're telling a bunch of off-color stuff. And you come up in the middle of that, and you can do one of two things. You can jump in the middle of it and you can accept it. You can might even chime in. Or you can hear that that's not really food for your soul and you can make an about face and go the other way. Most of the time, we're not bold enough to make the about face and go the other way. We would rather deny Christ to a point and be accepted by this crowd than to obey God and be accepted by what he wants out of our life. Now, that may not, it may not be something you think, well, it's really not that big a deal. Let me tell you something. When Christ is not forefront of your life, it's a very, it's a very big deal. And when he's, not the, when he's not the first thought on your mind and the first word rolls off your tongue and he's not, he's not the person that you're checking with to make sure that what you're doing is what you should be doing, we got a problem. And the problem is, is that in many of our churches and in many of the Christian circles, we're okay just checking the box today at 11 o'clock and getting by that we've gone to service. But outside of church, outside of the 11 o'clock hour or maybe a Sunday night hour or a Wednesday night, outside of that, we kind of live life like we want to. And I can promise you, that ain't going to cut it for long. A lot of people are in a position where they fake it till they make it. And there's going to be a day when that, when that reality is going to step up and it's going to be, I got to make a decision because there's a lot of people you can be around and because they don't really have a walk with God, they won't know the difference in your walk if you've got one or if you don't have one. And so the crowd you hang out with could literally be, literally can be a, now it could be a good sponge for you to lie on because, hey, they're not going to hold you accountable. They're not going to be the one to, hey, how, you, are you spending time in the word? Hey, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't do, you're not going to be that. And so we, sometimes we, we resort to, to hanging around that group of people that's not going to hold us accountable. You know why? Because we kind of like the gray area. We kind of like living in that gray area. It's, hey, we're not as bad as we used to be, but we're no near what God wants us to be. We live in the gray area. We, we're okay with gray. We don't like dark anymore, but we're okay with gray. 
Because we look too weird if we're on the white. Look what Scripture says in Mark chapter 14. Jesus is about to be arrested or just got arrested. And he's before the Sanhedrin. I want to start with verse 61. And I want you to take your Bibles and stand with me. I'm going to read all these scriptures at, at first. That may mess up the PowerPoint guy, and that's okay. Because the dead in the middle of this message this week, I changed the scripture. Evie was so excited that I'd gotten the sermon to her and that she had made the PowerPoint, then I called her on Thursday, about an hour before she was about to get off. She just said, we've got to change everything. Well, great. Praise the Lord. She wasn't singing the Hallelujah Chorus, Okay. Beginning with verse 61, it's not on your screen. I'll start, screen starts 66, so don't worry about Aaron. It's my deal. But I want you to, I want to back this up with verse 61. So he's standing before the Sanhedrin. Here's where it starts. But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, Son of the Blessed? Verse 62. Jesus said, look what he says. What does he say? Say it with me. I am. Clear as a bell, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now, in case I don't get to the second point today, I want you to know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about God in human flesh. The Bible says that in and, and, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we need to understand that when we're talking about this, he says, he, what he's saying is not are you just God's son. What he's saying is are you God? And the answer that he gave him is I am. I am. You can't separate the two. You can't separate the two. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the, cl coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes. Can you imagine? He is flipping out. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need we have of witness? You have heard the blasphemy. He's accusing Jesus of blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him. Can you imagine? Some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and to say to him, prophesy. In other words, you didn't see us hit you, so who hit you? You're such God, you're supposed to know everything. Hmm. Look at verse 66. Now, as Peter was below the courtyard, Peter denies him. This is the denial. This is, this is what's going on while all this is happening to the Lord Jesus. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. Look at verse 68. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch. Look at this now. This is huge. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by, who stood by said to Peter again, surely you are one of them. For you are a Galilean. Look at this. And your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man whom you speak. The second time, the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Hmm. And when he went throughout, he wept. It shows sorrow, but something I want to show you this morning that that's why I'm speaking out of the book of Mark and not Luke. It's the only time in Scripture where it says that the rooster will crow twice. I never saw that. I didn't understand all that. And I'm, I hope I can really unpack that and explain that to us in just a moment. Father, I just pray right now that you would take this Scripture and you would help us to apply it to us personally. Let us not point at Simon Peter. Let us not point at somebody else who needs to hear this. Let us look in the mirror and realize, Lord, there have been many times we've denied you. There have been many times we've denied the very existence of you because of the crowd or the circumstances we're around. And I'm asking you today, right now, in front of these people, and I hope that I'm not by myself, but I'm asking you for forgiveness because I've not been the Christian all the time that I should be as a child of God. 
And I pray right now, Father, you would help us to realize, Lord, you have got a word in this text for us. And I pray that today we'd never be the same because of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And we talked about Simon Peter last week. And you need to understand that, that Peter, when all the transaction was going on, sleep, Peter was sleeping when he should have been praying. He was talking when he should have been listening. My mama used to say that, said, boy, if you would listen as much as you would talk, you would learn a whole lot more. She said, your mouth's going to get you in more trouble. I'm reminded of that her one day. I said, mama, I want you to know, you said my mouth would get me in trouble. I want you to know my mouth's where I make my living. How about that, mama? She didn't see the, she didn't see the humor in it. He was boasting when he should have been fearing. Now he was fighting when he should have been surrendering. Think about this. Peter was using the wrong weapon to face the wrong enemy. He took that sword that Jesus said, let this be even, leave and let this pass. He took that same sword and he cut off the ear. We talked about it last week. But when he should have been surrendering and when he should have been praying, when he should have been listening, he was doing everything but. Here's what we do sometimes. We pray for God to give us an answer, but we're so quick on not getting the answer, we start acting on our behalf and we wonder why God doesn't bless it. Let me tell you something. When you pray, God's got three answers. Yes, no, and not right now. Boy, that not right now has got me in more trouble, y'all. The fact that, that, I, that, I, that I shoot out there and do my own thing and I get out there and think, oh man, what have I done? Why did I do this? See, even in the face of the enemy, Jesus is busy cleaning up the mess that Peter had created. He lovingly healed this slave, and then those same hands he offered to say, take me into captivity. Same hands. Those same hands would soon be nailed to the cross. Same hands. He picked up the guy who was going to take him to the cross, and he healed his ear. You know why? Because he knew what God had planned for his life. He knew, he, in the very beginning, he knew why he was there. Can I tell you that some of, the, some of the darkest days of your life, if you'll look back now, you'll realize that some of the darkest days in your life have been the most productive days of moving you where God wants you to be. I'm going to tell you, there's been some days, man. I'm about to celebrate 53 years, and there have been some days I'd like to forget. They'd like, they'd like to be, hey, there's some months and years I'd like to forget. There's some days the things about my life as a Christian, as a pastor, as a person on staff, as a father, as a husband. There are days I'm thinking, man, if it was based on performance, I would have been gone to hell a long time ago. Because I don't know about you, but I don't perform well sometimes. I have a question for you. Just, to, just think about this, and then we'll get it right, right into the message. Here's opposition in its biggest form. Here's the guy. Now think about it. Peter... James and John are the three guys who were, with, who were with Jesus all the time. They had the crowd, they had the 12, then it was 11, then they had the three. So this is one of the guys that's not just heard about him. This is the guy that's not just uh, kind of seen him from a distance. This is the guy who's been with him intimately. He knows the secrets of what's going on. And that guy right there can't even stand up for the cause of Christ. Boy, it kind of scares me. Because here's the guy that was used greatly. He's about to preach the greatest message to start the New Testament church. And he still can't stand up for God. So I have a question for you. How do you handle opposition? Let me give you some choices. Do you accept it as if it's God's plan? Here's another one. Do you try to fix it? I do. Do you look at it as maybe it's, maybe God has a plan. That's usually after you've tried to fix it. That's the way I am. Because they didn't fix something. Well, probably, maybe God's got something. It sounds real spiritual. Well, God's got a plan. Knowing the whole time, I don't like it. What about this one? Do you fight tooth and nail as you are the one that should not have to go through this? I've done that. Lord, I, I'm doing everything the right way. God, I am loving my wife. I'm loving my kids. I'm loving my church. I'm trying to stay in the word. I'm trying to perform well. And why in the world would you allow this to happen to me? When this guy over here running around on his wife, this guy over here is doing this, that, and the other, and he seems to be fine. Why am I taking the blunt of stuff? It's like God says, I'm not doing in his life what I want to do in your life. You know, we talked about four things last week. We talked about the garden. Then the cup, then the kiss, then the sword. And I want to deal with one thing today, the crowing rooster. I don't know about you, but I've crowed before. 
and I've heard it crow, and I did nothing about what I was hearing. Have you ever heard the, I want to ask you that, and I want you to raise your hand on this one if it, if it applies to you. How many of you could say, I have felt, I felt like I have heard that still small, small voice of God speak to my life? Yeah. No, you say, I didn't hear it audibly. I'm not talking about audibly. I'm talking about, the Bible says that my sheep know me. They know my voice and they follow me. See, if you're not a follower of Christ, you can say, I prayed all those prayers, but if you're not a follower of Christ, Scripture says that you're not his son. Scripture says you're not his child. Because he says, my sheep know my voice, and they follow me. Not everyone that says to me on that day, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. I can tell you one thing. You may be out of God's will, but if you're a Christian, you're dying to get back to where God is. And if it doesn't bother you, friend, I would hope that you would find yourself repenting this morning and asking the Lord Jesus to come to your heart and change your eternal life. The crowing rooster. They arrested Jesus and led him to the high priest. But I want you to look at verse 40, uh, 54. Look what it says. I'm not even in Mark, y'all. What happened to my Bible here? Look what it says in verse 54. And this is where a lot of us are sometimes. But Peter followed him out of what? A distance. Right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. I want you to look at that very first part where it says, and Peter followed him at a distance. I hate going to Atlanta. I literally despise Atlanta traffic. Now my son's moved there, and God forbid if I'm going to have to go visit them. We're going to meet halfway. I'm in Jesus' name. We're going to meet halfway. We went down for his birthday. We met halfway because that's what God said, meet halfway. <laughs> but there is a road, there's a perimeter around the Atlanta area. It's called 285. Now, 285 is there. In fact, if you're a big truck, you've got to have permission. You've got to have delivery to go into Atlanta. But here's what happens. Many people, 285 is sitting there, and it is, the, it is literally uh, the perimeter around the city. Here's what it means. It gives you access to downtown without dealing with downtown traffic. So as long as you're on Latin, unless you're Pasquale Perez, that you're just circling. If you don't know the 1990 Braves, you understand who that is, all right? But many people are on this journey, and they're circling. Now, here's the thing. The city represents the throne of God. The city represents God. And we are circling. We have just enough God in our life to where we have access to what he can do for us. We have access that we can get to him without having to deal without all the stuff that he expects out of us. And we have a perimeter God. We are just circling the perimeter. Hey, I like being at church. I like what the church can do for me. I like the fact that God's blessing my life. I like the fact that God's healing. But don't expect me to walk with him daily. That's downtown traffic, and I ain't got time for that. <laughs> Peter was on the perimeter. He followed him, but at a distance. And I'm talking to some people this morning that have that perimeter God mindset. Oh, you love what the church can do for you. You love the fact that God is, oh, he's, he's hey, my life now is so much better than it was. But that, oh, oh, I don't want to get off of 285 and get in the middle of that traffic. Oh, I'm going to kill somebody. Somebody's going in the wall. Peter was at a distance. The second thing, Peter was in the courtyard. Look at verse 66 and 67. Look what it says. Verse 66, it says, Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand who, what you are saying. Wow. And he went out on the porch. Look at this. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. 
He said, I thought he had to die him three times. This is the only portion of Scripture that talks about the rooster crowing two different times. And so it got interest in me. I remember the night that I made my first, first time I stepped out of my seat and went to the altar. I was an 11-year-old boy. And I'll never forget, I was at youth camp in Dorval, Georgia. You remember, guys, where the old Dorval youth camp used to be over in Georgia? The Church of God youth camp. I went every year. Didn't want to go. Made to go. Went. They I don't want to go. You going? Why come? Because I said so. All right, Tim, going. I'll never forget it was on a Tuesday night. I knew the Holy Spirit was dealing with me. It's the same feeling that many of you have when we get to an invitation time and you know God is speaking to you, but you still sit in your seat. And you love the fact that, hey, we're going to, our invitation today is we're all going to come forward as a church and pray. You love that because you can step out of your seat and come with the crowd. Nobody ever knows. And you can claim as I went forward, I prayed the prayer, and you can hang on to that for a while. I did that. 11 years old, I was sitting about right there in the choir. I wasn't singing. That was just the only seats at that time. And I sat up there because there were some cute little girls up there. I remember that. I went to church for the right reason. You understand that. I remember they gave the invitation, and the Spirit of God was knocking on the door, man. I'm talking about saying, you need to go. You need to go. You know what I did? I sat right there. In fact, I hunkered down. And that altar got slapped full of people. Therefore, nobody saw me anymore. Guess what I did? I got out of my seat. I went down. I knelt down right there. I prayed that little prayer they told me to, and I went back to my seat. Checked the box. Went home that, went to my dorm afterwards. Called my mom. Mom, I prayed to, I prayed to, I prayed to invite Jesus into my heart. Oh, praise the Lord, honey. They're shouting and rejoicing on 9950 High Tower Road, Roswell, Georgia. 30075. 404 993 4397. Still remember all of them. <laughs> I'm talking about calling everybody. October the 11th, 1976, I was baptized in Willard Bearden Swimming Pool. Honest, they had a sign on the wall. It said, Don't pee in our pool, we don't swim in your toilet. At my baptism. I'll never forget it. I was like, well, hallelujah. Why you remember those things, I don't know. But <laughs> All through the rest of my life, till I was 19 years old, I kept dealing with that, dealing with that. And those of you who have heard my testimony know that. See, so here's what happened at the age of 11. I went on my terms. I didn't go on his terms. Age of 19, eight years later, man, God got a hold of me. And I'm going to tell you, the rest is, I've never been the same. But I've learned something. Now, listen to me. I'm not, I'm not here to be your judge today, but I am going to tell you the truth. And that is, if you're here today like I was, and you've done all the motions they've told you to do, but you can't get peace in your life every day when you, or every night when you go to sleep. And when you're walking through, and every time you hear an invitation, the Spirit of God's dealing with you, and you can't get peace. Let me tell you what you need to do. You don't need to recommit your life. You need to give up, settle the score, and get saved. Because we got a lot of people that are rededicating something they never had in the first place. Because the Bible says, unless the Holy Spirit draws you, you cannot be saved. It's not about praying a prayer. It's not about going through the motions. It's not about doing what everybody else. It's about turning my life over to Christ and allowing him to be in charge, the Lord of my life. But there's three denials right there. The first denial in verse 66 through 68, we just read, a young girl sees him and he says, wait a minute, weren't you with him? Peter says, oh, no, oh, no. But I got to thinking, he's the only one of the disciples that's mentioned. In other words, more than Peter standing in the garden, where did everybody else go? Well, the Bible says in John 18, 8, it says this. It tells us that when they approach Jesus, he tells us, he says, let all these other disciples go so that the scripture may be fulfilled, which said, of those that you have given me, I've lost no one. So he tells them to scatter. He even told them beforehand, when this happens, many are going to scatter sharing the gospel. 
So it kind of looks like Simon Peter is the only one there. I'm sure there were more. That's what the scripture teaches. But I want you to see what happens. She comes to him and she says, aren't you with him? Weren't you one of the guys? He said, oh, no. I don't even know. He said, I don't even know. I don't even, I don't even understand what you're talking about. I don't even know what you're talking about. And look what happened next in verse 68. The rooster crowed the first time. As I said a while ago, Mark is the only one of the four gospels that even brings this out. He says, when he's sitting at the, he's sitting at the, at the table before this all happens, he says, Peter, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Look at what he says. Peter says this in verse 30. Surely I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Verse 31, but he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Wow. But I want you to see the next part of that verse. If you'll miss this sometime, because we're always focusing on Simon Peter. Look at the last part of that. He says, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Everybody sitting at the table said, oh, no, we're in the same boat with Peter. We're not about to, we're not going to deny you. Ain't no way. And every one of them tuck, tail, and run. These are the guys that were, hey, side by side with him. These are the guys that went everywhere he went. And the ones that knew his best, knew everything about him, couldn't even hang out, couldn't even stand up for him. That's why you have so much trouble. That's why we're having so much trouble with some things in our life. But I want you to see this. If you, this, may be the, this may be the whole sermon, and, I, and I, I don't know, but I want you to see this. He says, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. So he goes in there, and he is approached, and he denies him. The Bible says that he walks out on the front porch. Now, I've been to Caiaphas' house, but there's no house there, but the area. And he walks out on the porch, and as soon as he walks out on the porch, what does the Scripture say happens? Rooster crows first time. I thought to myself, why do the other Gospels not even bring this out? And I don't know the answer to that except for the fact maybe, could be, or could it be that Simon Peter might have been the only one that heard that rooster the first time. See, here's what I know. It's that sometime when you're about to enter into a bad decision, the Holy Spirit will give you a check. He'll say, hey, hey, don't take another step. You're fixing to mess up. Don't do it. And if you're like Chris Pritchett, you're going to test that second step. But if you want to be like God, I didn't have this in my notes, but let me just give it to you. I think it'll fit. The Bible says that, the, that Satan is like a roaring, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I've shared this years ago, and I don't know if it'll fit. I think it'll fit real good right here, so just, let's just go with it. Read some story on a lion's roar. It can be heard five miles away. Five miles away. And so here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we're supposed to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, seeks about looking for, some, looking for something to eat. And so here's the thing. If I'm real cautious about my walk, as I'm walking, if I'm just haphazard walking on, I may not even hear the roar. But if I'm walking... And I'm trying to be sober and vigilant. It means my mind's right. It means my focus is on. I, 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 I'm, I'm sober. I'm vigilant in my Christian walk. And let me tell you something. I hope you're sober. I hope your mind's right. And I hope you're vigilant. I hope you're focused on the things of God. But as I'm walking, all of a sudden I take a step and I hear from the distance. I can do one of two things. I can take another step. Or I can resist him and go the other direction. See, here's the thing. As old and as slow as I am, if I got a five-mile head start, I can outrun him. But if I keep being inquisitive and keep checking and saying, what is that? Oh, it's a little tiger. Oh, okay. <laughs> And I get where he's in earshot, and I get where I can see him. I said, oh, boy, it's a big old tiger. Wow. 
If I, listen, if I wait till he sees me, I'm lunch. I'm lunch. But if I take the warning, if I listen to the rooster crow the first time, and I think, "Uh uh-oh, uh-uh, not me, not me, buddy. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Listen, he don't want to nibble at you. He don't want to bite you. He wants to eat you. And here's Peter. He's, he's flirting with it. Goes out on the porch. You him? No. Ah! All of a sudden, Peter's got to make a decision. Ah! Uh, Rooster's got a cold today. I need that guy on Facebook. Oh, 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 oh. And he comes out there, and when that rooster crows, it's a reminder to everything that God, Jesus told him up at the supper table. Peter, I'm telling you, before it crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. He, listen, he was at a crossroads right there on that front porch. He was there, right there, son. One more step. Or one more step this way. And I, can I tell you this? The Bible says, let no temptation take you but such as is common to man. But with the temptation will offer you a way to escape that you may be able to bear it or endure. Sometimes we're praying for God to get us out of temptation's way when we put ourselves there. And then when we get there, he said, you know what? I'm going to test you, Lord. No, 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 no. I don't want you to test me because I want to enjoy my life. After all, I'm I'm, I'm supposed to be happy. Not in the book. does say you're supposed to be faithful and obedient. And so if I'm walking and all of a sudden, man, I fall into some temptation or I fall into some, some testing, James tells me I'm supposed to rejoice. I don't like that. But many of us, there's a run in this carpet right here. Been here a while. Let's just say that this side of the carpet, I've done fallen off the the train. And I've given in to sin. And there is some shaky ground right here. But over here is solid ground. Most of us live our Christian life towing the line. Shaky ground. And one bobble, boom. Instead of walking over here where there's solid foundation. You know what David said, prayed in Psalms, Lord, widen my footpath so that I may not stumble. Oh, my goodness. That's a word, man. Widen my footpath. Because you find yourself sometimes when you're teetering. Yes, last Sunday a guy came up to me after church. You may even be here. He said, how many times you fell off that stage? Thank God none, but I've been close. Because I'm toying with the line. And Peter, man, is just out there just kind of, he's so inquisitive and he's so curious. Or as Andy Griffith said, curse, 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 curse. <laughs> and that curse get more of us in trouble. Instead of just, listen, we say Jesus is enough, but he's not for us. I about did it then. See, we, we say, oh, Jesus is enough. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But yet we'll walk out of here and we'll get as close to the enemy as possible. And we'll wonder why we keep falling in the ditch. And I thought to myself, how many warning shots do I need to walk in a right relationship with God? There's times I've got about to say something. And God will stop me and say, don't do that. Guess what I do? I said anyway. And then I say, Lord, I'm sorry. He said, shut up. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> Jerry Clemens, my buddy, talks about playing games at the foot of the cross. I think we're doing that. I think we're playing games with God. 
Let me finish with this. There's a song David's going to sing in just a minute, and I think it's going to be fitting for our closing. In fact, you can go ahead and get ready, David, if you want to, you and Martha. But I just want to kind of give you this. It's three denials. First time he denies. The second time, she sees him again, verse 69. He says, she says, aren't you him? No, not me. Mm -mm. But I want you to look at verse 71. Verse 71, it says, she asked him again, and then he began to curse and swear. This is a man that's about to preach a great message. This is a guy who's literally walked beside him. Wow. They said, oh, no, we know it's you because I can tell by the way you talk. You're Galilean. Now, I don't know what Galileans did, but it was a different dialect. I don't know if he walked in there and said, hey, boy. I don't know if he did that. I don't know if he walked in and said, que pasa? I don't know if he did that or not. I don't know if he said, well, so. I don't know what he did. But the way he spoke gave him away. Oh, man, what? A, listen, y'all. This may not be a word to anybody but your pastor today, but I want to give you this. Sometimes the way you speak gives you away. I love Jesus, but what's coming out of your mouth is sour. What's coming out of your mouth is damaging. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communi communication come out of your mouth, but that which is edifying to those that hear it, that it may minister grace. Then he, he even uses the word in the King James, what's good for necessary edification. Not, mama, you say, well, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. I got a question. If what you're about to say, is it necessary? If it's not, you shouldn't say it. Peter said, I don't know what you're saying. I just want you to see this picture, if it's up there, Aaron, the, that one. This is the, what I talked to you about last week. This is a hole on the upper floor at Kyvis' house. Now, the bottom floor is not even there, and, but that rock is still there. And they said in that day that when they had a prisoner, that hole was where they dropped him down into the dungeon. They just didn't push him off in a hole, but they literally had a rope around, kind of they showed us that kind of shoulders and kind of held them like this. And they would, when they wanted to try them or speak to them, they'd hoist them up by the rope. If not, they just laid them down in the dungeon. In the dungeon. In the book of Luke, when Peter denies Christ that third time, the Bible says that Jesus just kind of looked over at him as to say, mm-hmm, told you, told you. But don't forget, he still chose him. See, here's where people are sometimes. Now, listen to me. I'm not condoning all the junk that we have in our life. That's a whole other sermon, but listen to me. There is something called grace that's hard to understand. And when he looked over at Peter, Peter couldn't help but think, yeah, I did exactly what he said I would do. But maybe he remembered what, what he said in the book of Luke. He said, Peter, but remember, I prayed for you. I prayed for you. And I love you, man. Even though you denied me. See, a lot of people have lived a life so far away from God for so long. And they're over here thinking, I can never get back there. Let me give you some good news today. If God is that speaker right there, and you've gotten so far away from Him, that God is not still over at that speaker. He's right here. All He wants you to do is turn around. Just turn around. Because we have this mindset that I've got to perform well enough to get back there before God can ever do anything in my life again. No, you just need to start, stop where you are and turn around. He's right there. We sometimes think, oh, I'll never get back there. Can I be honest with you? God doesn't want you to get back there because there's where you were. God said, there's been a whole lot of stuff in your life, and I'm going to use that if you'll allow me and give it to me. I'm going to use that. I'm going to take your mess and make it your message. So I have this question, and then David's going to sing. What are you afraid of? Peter would not stand up for Christ because he was afraid of what it may cost him. There's an old song that says, I'm a winner either way. It's about a lady who's needing healing. They're praying for healing, and she says, you know what? 
thanks for the prayers and I hope God heals me. But if not, I'm a winner either way. Wow, what a, what a thought. I'm a winner either way. Peter is a winner either way. If he, if he, uh, if he does not deny Christ, man, God's like, oh, yeah. But if he's, if he's put to death, if he's killed for standing up for Christ, Paul says to die is gain. So I ask you a question. Many of us are afraid of the fear of the unknown. I heard a quote this week, and I'll give it to you, and it says, faith, or, or fear is faith in the enemy. We got faith in everybody but God. We got faith in those friends that are going to leave you. When you start walking with God, those friends that you think are friends now, they're going to take a back seat, and guess what? You got more faith in pleasing them than you do him. One last thing, and I'm going to ask David just start singing. I just want you to listen to it. And I want you to think about this thought while he sings this song. The altar is wide open, but we'll give an invitation in a minute. Many times people are afraid of figuring out, how do I make God a part of my life? You're looking at it all wrong. God does not want to be a part of your life. He wants to take over your life. Sing, David. When he's told you you're not good enough, he told you you're not right. When he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight, when he told you you're not worthy, he told you you're not paved out a way he's already paved it out for you maybe you're here this morning you've never trusted Christ boy God has been dealing with you and dealing with you and dealing with you can I help can I, can, will, you, will you just listen just for a moment what are you allowing in your life to keep you out of heaven what is more important than surrendering and saying I surrender what is more important is it your family is it your spouse? Is it your job? Is it your money? Maybe today you just need to wave the white flag and say, I surrender. You say, I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. I'm afraid of how I'm going to do. Yeah, fear's a liar. Maybe you're here and you're a, you're a believer, just like Simon Peter were. Man, you, you know you're saved. But there's some fears in your life. And Satan is using that to win every day, the battle every day in your life. Maybe you're here, you've never trusted Christ. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're a whosoever, we all are. And you'd be honest right where you are. Right where you're seated, and you'd say, Lord, would you forgive me? I don't even know how to pray, Lord, but I know you're the only way to heaven. I give up. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. From this day forward, I want to follow you. I'm tired of putting it off. I'm tired of playing. Today, I surrender my life to you. Just a moment, we're going to stand. And when we stand, 
He's going to continue to sing. Denise will be down here. I'll be down here. Nate will be down here. Terry will be down here. And if you need somebody to pray with you, you just come and take them by the hand. Whatever your need is this morning, but don't put it off. Don't put it off. Obey God what he says to you. Father, in Jesus' name, give us freedom to respond. Draw us to yourself. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as you continue to sing. He told you. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope this sermon has spoken to your life. Whether you're sitting at home, maybe you're on the road or on vacation, or maybe you have a sick child, or maybe today you decide to stay home, but you came across our Facebook page or our website, you heard this sermon, and God spoke to your heart. Scripture says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It also says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, behold, is a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things become new. Almost 33 years ago, I realized I was a whosoever and God changed my life. I was 19 years old. And I can tell you for 33 years, it's been as fresh today as it was then. Maybe today you want to make a decision for Christ or maybe you already have. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you could contact us on Facebook, call our phone, or you could just uh, look our website up. We would love to hear what God may have done in your life today. I hope you have a great week and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much for...